Hello, this is my first reaction video. One of my friends suggested I take a look at this video you see here on YouTube by Sabi Sabs, I think her name is. The West is fuming over Maduro election. She said that it contains some strong arguments, so she asked me to look at it and see what my opinion is. So here we go. I think I started the recording, so now I'll put it on full screen and we will get right into it. A lot went down the other day. Venezuela had an election and Maduro won again. And now what's interesting about this is when corporate media first started reporting this, they said that Maduro and his opposition both claimed that they won the election. So you had both sides saying that they were the ones that won. Uh, in the end, the results revealed that Maduro won, but I want to start off with the- Hang on, the results from whom? She's taking a position here without evaluating the evidence. The way that CNN, corporate media in particular, were covering this, you have to understand what someone like Maduro means to the West. All right. Already it starts to sound like this is propaganda. Uh, and especially according to the U.S. government and what this is really all about. This is not just about Maduro. And what does she mean by to the U.S. government. I thought she was American. Bro, this is also about resources, and this is about anyone that is against U.S. US uh, intervention. And then it also, Israel is mixed in with this as well. There's a lot going on here. Let's start off by breaking it down. That first announcement here, when they said that both sides were saying that they won. Now, we are continuing to monitor the situation in Venezuela, where authoritarian President Nicolas Maduro has been declared the winner of Sunday's election. That's according to the country's National Electoral Council. Maduro suggested there would be bloodshed if he lost, but shifted his rhetoric after being declared the winner. That is exactly right, what CNN reported. He was declared the winner by his own Electoral Council, and he threatened with violence if he lost. Lo dije. I said it. There was peace before and there was, during and we have it. And there will be peace, stability and justice after the 28th of July starting from today. Peace, justice, respect of the law and justice. Well, Maduro's main challenger was opposition candidate Edmundo Gonzalez Urrutia, a former diplomat who uh, the coalition rallied behind after their two preferred candidates were barred from rule of running. Uh, speaking in Tokyo, uh, moments after the result was announced, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken called on the electoral authorities to ensure transparency and accountability. We've seen the announcement just a short while ago by the Venezuelan Electoral Commission. We have serious concerns that the result announced does not reflect the will or the votes of the Venezuelan people. Let me go ahead and correct that. What he really means to say is that it doesn't respect the will of the U.S. government. Excuse me. The ones who have to decide about who will be the president of Venezuela is the Venezuelan people, not the U.S. government and not you, Sabrina Salvati, not you. This is Antony Blinken here. The U.S. government is not happy with the results of the Venezuela election. And this is just... Of course, because what the CNA has said does not reflect the actual vote of the Venezuelan people. This woman has a serious problem with evaluating evidence. It's another example of the U.S. government, again, trying to determine and intervene in another country's uh, election. And this Sorry, <laughs> the Venezuelan people voted. The Venezuelan people decided who they wanted as president, not the U.S. government. All the U.S. government is doing is evaluating the evidence, something that Sabrina Salvati does not seem capable to do. She hasn't analyzed the evidence yet. Let's see what if she gets to that. This is not the first time. So here we are again, where the same country that 
accuses Russia and China of trying to meddle in their elections has absolutely no problem meddling in other countries' elections. There was nothing here that said that the U.S. had meddled in the Venezuelan elections. There's nothing. She's making that up out of thin air. And notice what she said about the U.S. government criticizing Russia and China. She is spewing out communist propaganda. This is propaganda. Now, I am going to break this down to you and explain to you why what he is saying about the results of the election and the U.S. government not believing it is BS because there have been multiple independent journalists on the ground in Venezuela. BS. I call BS. The journalists who were independent, who tried to go to Venezuela, had their visas canceled and or were thrown out of the country. There are lots of examples of that. Foreign election observers who were independent had their invitation canceled and they were not allowed and or they were thrown out of the country. Meanwhile, a lot of openly, and I mean openly, pro-regime election observers and journalists, in quotation marks, came in. And there are many witnesses of that. Just yesterday, I heard from a source connected to the Norwegian Foreign Service that in the airport of Caracas, a Norwegian woman trying to leave Venezuela got into a discussion with an election observer from Spain who was openly pro-government, who said that the Maduro victory was fair and square. She got into an argument with him and, this, and uh, according to her point of view, obviously it was not fair and square. Obviously the opposition won, because that's what the evidence tells us. And you know what they did with her? The Guardia Nacional, the National Guard, came, arrested her, and threw her in jail for daring to say that Maduro lost the election. How fair and square is that? Not to mention the millions and millions of Venezuelans living abroad as refugees who were not allowed to vote in the election. According to the Maduro CNE, Election Authority, he won by a few percentage points. Now, if all of these millions of Venezuelans, one fourth of the population is living abroad and practically nobody was allowed to vote of them, if they would have been allowed to vote, Maduro would have lost even with his own count. This was not a fair and square election and the reporting from Venezuela was extremely biased. Shame on her. Shame. Venezuela covering this election. And what they have told me is that Venezuela's elections are actually one of the most secure elections that we have in the world. It is more secure than U.S. elections, right? Right. That's what the Carter Center says, that you can monitor the Venezuelan elections. And you know what their result was when they monitored this election? That they committed fraud. The Carter Center left Venezuela without giving a report because they knew that they were at risk of being detained if they had spoken out inside Venezuela, like that Norwegian woman I just said. So they left Venezuela and when they were in safety in the United States of America, then they issued a scathing report of these elections. They are nowhere near fair and square. These are not democratic elections. And shame on her again. Shame on her to throw criticism on her own country. So, of course, Antony Blinken is going to lean that out. And this is why it's important that you follow these independent journalists. Make sure you follow people like Anya Perenpil, who wrote an entire book called Corporate Coup about her time in Venezuela and what was done there during that time. She has been there. She has covered this information. Make sure you follow people like Rania Kalik, who is I've also been to Venezuela. I've been a hostage of Nicolas Maduro. So my view is a little bit different. 
when you go to a totalitarian regime, I'm, I'm speaking for my farm in Sweden. This farm was bought by my grandfather, who was invited by Stalin to Russia, to the Soviet Union, to Ukraine, in 1932, to supposedly see that there was no Holodomor going on. But he wasn't so stupid to fall into that trap. He went out and looked. He sneaked out the window, climbed down from the hotel window with sheet to go around and look for himself. And he saw that there was a Holodomor going on. And he came home and he told people. They tried to murder him in Kremlin. They poisoned his food, but they poisoned the food of the wrong person because they had switched seat at the table in the banquet with Stalin present. And then he came home to Sweden and he went around and he told the truth about the Soviet Union. And the communists tried to kill him over and over again until he gave in to his wife's request to stop risking his life. They shot him, they sabotaged the car, they tried to beat him to death. He even has a new, he had a newspaper clip. When he got home in the morning, it said that he had been murdered. That's how these totalitarian regimes work. And it's incredible to me that an American woman can be so innocent, so ignorant as to believe what she hears from a totalitarian regime. Let's continue was also in Venezuela right now covering these elections. And also Professor Morandi is also talking about this has been on the ground as well. So there are a number of people that have been there on the ground and their reporting is a lot different from mainstream media. I've got sources in Venezuela too. I'm in contact with people who are in the country now, in hiding, scared for their lives because the regime is coming and taking them away. Anybody who has helped in this election, and there are hundreds of thousands who the opposition trained and mobilized to count the vote accurately because the regime was trying to hide the evidence. All of those are now in danger. Last night, this morning, I woke up and I saw a video on Instagram of a woman who was taken away just two hours before I woke up. She transmitted live on Instagram when they came to take her away because she had helped in the elections. The night, the morning of the election, July 28th, where my, another one of my contacts was going to work in an election center, they were there to set up the boots in the morning and regime thugs on motorbikes drove by shooting. And even so, the people did not flinch. They stayed their grounds, that was in Palo Tal and they voted, and the vast majority voted against Maduro. Something like 83%, I don't remember the exact figure in that election center. About 83% voted against Maduro. And my source was there in that election center, counting the votes until the very end, and then getting the actas, the document, and sending that to the opposition's vote counting center, where they took all those documents and they did a tabulation in the following days in a secret operation. That's incredible, absolutely epic, the nonviolent struggle they did. And they uploaded it to a website that I'll put the link here so you can go and see for yourself that they have the proof, they have the goods, and the regime doesn't. It's critical that every vote be counted fairly and transparently, exactly. that election officials immediately share information with the opposition and independent observers without delay, and that the electoral authorities publish the detailed tabulation of votes. The international community is watching this very closely mm -hmm. and will respond accordingly. And there it is, right? The international community is watching this very closely. Mm -hmm. uh, more That's so right. the U.S. government. Now, Anthony Blinken is big mad, folks. Anthony is big mad. Professor... This woman seems to be working for the Trump campaign, honestly. Everything she's doing is helping Donald Trump get elected. Mirandi tweeted this, and I want to show you guys this as well. I am currently in Venezuela. 
Every single international election observer that I have spoken with has stated that the presidential election was fully transparent and that the declared result is completely accurate. Yes. And you know why? Because all those who had opposing point of view who were independent either were not allowed to enter the country or had the wisdom like the Carter Center to keep their mouths shut until they were out of Venezuela. Because if they had spoken the truth inside Venezuela, they too could have been thrown in jail like that Norwegian woman I told you about. And you can see the results here from Camilla. You should follow her as well uh, on Twitter, Camilla, at Camilla Press. Breaking, Nicolas Maduro, so he has over a 5.1 5.1 million votes, 51.2%. And Edmundo Gonzalez had 44.2%. So... Now, remember, this is without the uh, Venezuelans, the expats, the refugees in other countries. And there are close to 8 million Venezuelans abroad. And the vast majority of them would have voted for Edmundo Gonzalez. You cannot call that a fair election when they deny such a huge proportion of the electorate the right to vote. You have 51.2% and 44.2%. It's not even close. <laughs> Is she stupid? Okay. Okay. That was at 80% of tables counted, 59% turnout. So these are the people that were actually there. Now the US- So she's saying the opposition was not there? <laughs> government this is may not pathetic. like the fact that Maduro has won. You yourself may the not be- The fact, this woman is beyond stupid. That's pure propaganda, it's BS, pure Russian propaganda. And she's doing this, I don't know if she knows it, but she's doing this to help Donald Trump get elected. On of Maduro. But that doesn't mean you get to lie about what happened at that election, about the results, and then also try to implement a coup because you are unhappy. What coup? The one who did a coup was Nicolas Maduro. He lost the election and he's trying to hold on for dear life with the use of unmitigated violence. He's threatening bloodshed. He did that already before. He's threatening to detain anybody who protests. He brags about the fact that he's thrown 2,000 people in jail. He's killed over 20 people. And she says the peaceful opposition are doing the coup? Come on. I mean, there are limits for how out of crazy you can be. Th that the leader that you wanted to win did not win. The U.S. government is notorious for doing this. I don't understand why these leftists are criticizing their own government. We have a democratic president, Joe Biden. I mean, what do they want? Do they want a communist? Because what they're going to get, if they get their will, is Donald Trump. Now we go on for more here. And I believe I also do have this from, yes, Anya is coming up after, Ronnie is coming up after this. Anya Perimpil, I suggest you follow her as well. When it comes to Venezuela, again, she wrote a book. The book has been published. I think she was on a book tour recently called Corporate Coup. It is about the coups in Venezuela. She was there on the ground. I heavily recommend. There have been coups in Venezuela. The first coup, well, Hugo Chavez tried to make, make a military coup on uh, February 4th, I think it was uh, 1992, and then again in November. And then when he failed to do military coup, he ran for office and he won the elections. And as soon as he had got into the office, to the office of the presidency in 1999, he did a coup. He did a judicial coup d'etat in which he got the, the Supreme Court, does it ring a bell? To agree to hold a constituating 
constitutional assembly. Like, imagine, we have a constitution in the U.S., right? Imagine that the president would say, all right, please, Supreme Court, do I have your permission to flush this constitution down the toilet and write my own? That's what they did in Venezuela. Because when they wrote a new one, 92% of those who wrote it were allies of Chavez. That when it comes to this topic, that you follow her for this information, because again, this is someone who researched this for years in person. I want you to see what she said. Don't turn off your critical thinking skills just because you have been told Venezuela is socialist your whole life. Stop right there. Ven who says Venezuela is socialist? Venezuela does. It's called the socialist, re the Bolivarian Republic. It's called so because the, of the Bolivarian Socialist Revolution. When I was there, kidnapped by the ELN guerrilla, they told me Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua are revolutionary countries. And ELN is a revolutionary communist. They mean the same thing, uh, organization. So they are together. Fidel Castro himself, when asked, Say, he was asked if Venezuela under Hugo Chavez was communist. And he said socialism and communism, Bolivarian socialism and communism is the same thing. So this, you, she's trying to, to fool you. She's trying to fool you. This is absolutely incredible. When they themselves claim to be socialist, when Fidel Castro himself said that they are communist, and she's trying to make you think that they are not. I mean, is it like the worst kind of propaganda I've seen in a long, long time? The Venezuelan opposition have claimed fraud and contested virtually every election that they have lost since Chavez came to power. Yet they can never provide evidence. That's also false. In the recall election 2004, after that, they had electronic voting. So, first of all, the regime tried to prevent it with illegal methods. One of the rectors of the CNE had to go in exile. She's a good friend of mine, and she, we've been working together with fighting for democracy in Venezuela for many years, Ana Mercedes Diaz. So, I know very well what happened there. The regime tried to sabotage the recall. And when she pointed out that the regime was trying to sabotage it, she had to go in exile. And then when they did the recall election, they did electronic voter fraud because they have a good system, right? But also a good system for cheating with. Oh, there's so many, so many things I could tell you, so many stories I could tell you about that, but let's try to go on with this. Just... Let me say that in 2004, there have been a lot of scientific articles written about that. It's proven beyond a reasonable doubt, scientifically, mathematically, statistically, that there was fraud in that. And then not to mention the next one, 2007, they stopped the counting. They wanted to change the constitution again to give even more power to Hugo Chavez. And they stopped the counting and gave the victory to the no because they realized that they had many more votes than there were voters. No election fraud? Really? And that is because Venezuela's electoral process is far more secure than what we have in the United States. I did the safest we have is in Sweden because it's counted manually. You vote on paper, you count the papers, you report it. Everything has to do, be manual and you have to have manual list and be able to check it up. Do not count any electronic system where you cannot go in and check every little digit. Describe the voting process in the country, which I have observed firsthand in my book, Corporate Coup. And by the way, I interviewed Anya about that book, uh, I believe a couple of months ago. It was before, it was right before it was published. So you can 
search for that on my channel where she talks about her experience in Venezuela. Now listen to this. In Venezuela, voting machines were activated through a two-step verification process consisting a physical check of the voter's national identity card and a digital scan of their fingerprint after casting their vote. You know, it reminds me of another election fraud I did because they've done so many different. They don't do just one. They do different things in different elections. And one of the things they did was simply you, you press this button, but the vote fell for that. So that's another thing you can do. There's so many ways to manipulate electronic voting. The voter received a physical receipt of their ballot, which they can personally drop in a secure box on site. The voter then signed their name and stamped their thumbprint on a physical electoral registry to certify their participation. When and that's what they use the opposition to, to make sure, because there is a backup of everything. There is a paper backup of all the electronic voting or votes. And the regime had their fags in the election polling places to try to make sure that the opposition would not get the copy they have the right to under the constitution. They denied them their copy. But the opposition had uh, foreseen this because the, the, what they have to do is they have to print out everything and then they have to print out one copy to the opposition and one to the third party if there are three major candidates. And they refused. They still haven't done it. But there was this physical, the, the acta, as it's called in Spanish. So the opposition had foreseen this and they had trained election workers, hundreds of thousands, in every polling place in all of Venezuela to fight, to fight, to keep those. And in a lot of places, they managed to get it, but they couldn't get it in all. They got over 80%. However, an interesting fact is that in a lot of polling places, they did not allow the opposition witnesses to come in even. What the regime hadn't foreseen was that in their own party, there were people who, were, who are against Maduro and who had conspired with the opposition and who got those actas and sent them, transmitted them to the opposition after the election. Maduro was stabbed in the back from opposition within his own party. About, I think, 36% of the actas were obtained by people election observers in Maduro's own party. When polls closed, authorities um, assaged fears of digital vote tampering by checking their final electronic tally against random sampling of 54% of the physical ballot receipts submitted by voters at polling stations. Citi Which was not done, obviously and international observers are present throughout this process. So does everybody hear that? Citizens and international observers. You think there is an international observer in every one of the, how many can it be? 20,000 polling places? Obviously not. The international observers, they see a few polling places and they only stay a short time in each one. There is a good article written about this, I forgot by who now, I think it was English, who went to Venezuela in one of these earlier elections the, before 2010. And it was very interesting how he described that the majority of these independent election observers were blatantly biased in favor of the regime in Caracas. And they blatantly close their eyes for irreg irregularities. It's, it's a sham. This, and also, I can tell you that a few days before the election, I think it was the Wednesday, on an airplane from Turkey that passed Cuba, there were a large number of election observers coming to Venezuela. They had canceled the invitation to Europe. They didn't allow a lot of them, but these were allowed. And many of them were from South Africa a BRICS country allied with Venezuela. And there was also a journalist 
entre comillas, within quotation marks, from Chile, who was extremely Chavista for the government, who had come to supervise the election. All of these, there are witnesses of, a lot of witnesses that have seen and observed that the international observers were blatantly pro-government. We cannot believe a word they said except the Carter Center because they left the country before they issued their analysis. Do not fall for claims of fraud unless hard evidence is produced. Hard evidence is produced. The website that they have set up contains hard evidence. You can go in and see the actas. The other day, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the regime had falsified paper printouts because they had thrown away the originals so they falsified it and they went on somebody went on tv to show oh look here are the results but they're so that they forgot to to change the qr code and the qr code of the website of the opposition matched exactly that of the government so you can see that they have falsified the digits they can't even do that correctly especially because further escalation in Venezuela will only result in civil conflict and perhaps even a regional war in the Western Hemisphere. You think our border looks bad now? Wait until Washington turns up the heat on Caracas. Hang on. If Maduro is allowed to stay in power, it has been estimated that a big new wave of emigration will leave Venezuela. When the last round of protests were going on around 2017-2018, the regime implemented a Holodomor, the same as in Ukraine, genocide by starvation, which forced people to flee the country and lay down their, their protests, their fight. So millions and millions fled the country in the years that followed. And today we have about 7.7 .7 million Venezuelans outside. When the news of this election was starting to come a year or two ago, and people started to get some hope again, the emigration stopped. Some people even came back. But now, if this hope is again quashed by people like her, Sabrina, then guess what they'll do? They'll flee the country again. The, the exodus will again take huge proportions because you can't live in Venezuela the way it is today. It's been estimated several million more Venezuelans will flee and a lot of them will come to, guess where? The southern border of the United States. And who's that going to benefit in the elections? Donald Trump. He is helping Donald Trump. Read my lips. Oh, and the Russian military has strong military ties with Venezuela and a presence within the country. We are not only talking about regional war here, but an expansion of the world war currently raging against Russia and its allied rising powers. Are you ready? for that war to hit Washington's backyard. Uh-huh. Here we see and hear Putin's words. This is Putin's threat against the American against the West to the American people. He is trying to scare you. He wants to scare you to stay out of Ukraine. He wants to scare you not to take action. Now, one thing she's not getting to. Well, let's see if she gets to it, but I doubt it. This is something I think people really need to think about before mm -hmm. we even get to the coup part. This is very important. So this piece here where Anya explains 
uh, the migration. So a lot of people have been complaining about the border issue. A lot of people have been complaining. They said, well, there's migrants coming from different countries and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. One of the things that Anya really has broken down, at least on this show, is that you have to understand why they're coming here in the first place. Uh -huh. So if you're looking at the U.S. government implementing more sanctions on Venezuela, which is possible, I could see them doing that. Sanctions ruin your country economically. They no, oh, that's wrong. Sanctions were implemented against the leaders of Venezuela for the crimes they are committing. The leaders of Venezuela are the ones who destroyed the country's economy, not the sanctions. It really hurt the country. The sanctions hurt the leaders. That's what they're there for. The sanctions are against a small group of people who are some of the world's most hardened criminals. She does, she doesn't mention that. How come she doesn't mention that? So if your country is ruined economic, they're destroying your country. What are you going to do? You are going to leave. The country was destroyed by Maduro. When people were protesting, he implemented measures to make sure that people didn't get enough food, because if you don't have food, you can't fight. Hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans starved to death because of Maduro's Holodomor. And the only reason that it didn't reach the millions as it did in Ukraine when Stalin implemented the exact same uh, policies in 1932 is because we in the resistance detected that Maduro had implemented the same policies as Stalin and we predicted what would happen and we had clandestine statistics because it was forbidden in Venezuela in 2017-2018 for the hospitals to report death by starvation. It was forbidden, but we got clandestine intelligence and we saw how the rate of deaths was increasing, especially small children, newborn children, and also some old sick people. But the, the death of newborn children was absolutely horrifying. And the projection, it was possible to make a projection based on how other starvation disasters in the world play out. And that starvation said that five, that projection said that five million people are liable to die of starvation within a year. And that's when we called the protests off and told people, if you don't have enough to eat, leave the country while you can still walk. Because the, the process of dying by starvation is that you get so weak that you can no longer walk. And then after that, you get to the point where even if somebody comes and gives you food, it's too late. Your organs have failed. So we had to take the decision to call off the protests and flee the country to live to fight another day. And we did that early in 2018. And that's why people fled Venezuela. And the amount of people who fled within a year matched very well the the prediction for how many would have died in starvation, about 5 million. I would say we saved about 5 million lives from, from genocide by Nicolas Maduro, her hero. Eve. And the hits are coming from the United States. Now, interestingly enough, the sanctions that the US government put on Russia have not seemed to work. Russia has been able to beat those. Venezuela has had to deal with this for years. So this is why I always say it's important that you connect domestic policy to foreign policy. So if it angers you that there are migrants coming across the border, you have to take a, a step back and look and see why are they coming here? What is happening? So here we go again. So this is what Anya is trying to warn you about. Let's get to the socialism piece here. With well, it's true that it is connected, but what she doesn't get is that the Biden administration is trying to help 
Venezuela with the sanctions. Biden is not the cause of the problem. It's an effect, it's a, it's a measure taken in order to try to alleviate it. However, I do agree with her on one point, and that is that the sanctions have not overthrown the criminal regime in Caracas. The genocidal, the crimes against humanity, the drug cartel, this is an extremely nefarious regime. And they are intimately connected with Putin, with Putin, Russia of Putin, with Iran, with North Korea, with China, and also with Assad and Syria, with Cuba, with Nicaragua, with Bolivia, and Honduras. But one country in particular should call your attention because it's a U.S. ally, Turkey. Erdogan's Turkey is an... That is a serious problem. That is a serious problem because everything indicates that Erdogan is allowing huge cocaine shipments to come to Turkey and from there get distributed over Europe. Which I also think... By the way, and, and I was going to get to this, that the reason the sanctions don't work is because all these are connected. We can't isolate all these because they are actually the majority in the world. It's we who are the minority. It's we who want democracy and freedom who are the minority. I think is important. Uh, one more point. The vast majority of Venezuela's economy, hotels, restaurants, stores are privately owned and operated. Venezuela's socialism is largely defined by the fact its industries, including its oil sector and precious mineral reserves, are nationally operated. Not true. The oil uh, company, PDVSA, was operated by the government since the 1970s. But what Hugo Chavez did was to sack the professionals and replace them with party loyalists. Does it ring a bell with MAGA and Trump? It should. And then he used PDVSA. Instead of being a professional oil producing company, it became a social benefit company that helped it was like social services under the umbrella of an oil company. However, that's not all. It also became a cocaine producing company. It's the front of the world's largest cocaine producing cartel that is responsible for in the order of a thousand tons of cocaine per year. And as an indictment, by the Department of Justice from 2020 says Maduro deliberately tried to flood the US and Europe because they don't see a difference. They hate all countries that are for freedom and democracy. They deliberately flood our countries with cocaine. So this is a deliberately deliberate weapon in an asymmetrical war. This makes Venezuela comparable to Russia and many other modern states that consider the natural resources stored within the nation to be the property of the republic rather than a few at the top. Now, why would the U.S. have an issue with the oil? Yeah, that's a good question, because why would we? If we want oil, we buy it. They produce it, we buy it. This is Russian propaganda. This is Putin propaganda. Why would they have an issue with the oil? She can't answer that question. She's making the question because she can't answer it, because it's pure BS. I have said this multiple times before. If you look at the countries that the US tends to target, I'm willing to bet you there's probably some resources there in that country that the US wants that they're not able to have. Venez <laughs> That's so wrong. It's incredible. Under Biden, there has been a license to a US oil company to cooperate with PDVSA because PDVSA has been destroyed by the revolution. They are unable to produce oil. Anyway, Venezuela has very poor quality oil. 
in order to produce that oil, the heavy oil, they have to mix it with lighter oil. And the way they did that in the past was with a refinery in Texas, in the U.S. So they had to export it to the U.S. But because Venezuela went from being an oil-producing country to being a cocaine-producing country, they neglected the oil sector. And eventually they are unable to produce oil too. And they had to import also oil from Iran to mix it up with. Venezuela is an obsession in Washington because before Chavez, this is so US ignorant. and European it's... companies practically owned the country and the IMF set its domestic economic agenda. Venezuela is home to the largest oil and untapped gold reserves in the world. Allegedly, but I don't believe it. Personally, I believe that the revolutionary government made up the figures of oil reserves in order to get large loans from countries like China, which they obviously are not going to pay back ever. And that's why China stopped lending them money. This is why Americans have been inundated with propaganda about Venezuela since it began the process of asserting sovereign ownership over that natural wealth. That is what their socialism is primarily about. So no, 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 no. That's that's fake. That's wrong. That's wrong. Oh, one of the things they've done is to get doctors from Cuba in, setting up a lot of small, what do you call it? Not medical centers, really, because there's no there's no doctor there, but health health centers. However, a large number of these Cubans are actually intelligence agents and they have brought military uniform with them and in protests in uprising they have been helping the regime to keep the people under control and in the in 2014 there were we according to our intelligence cuba flew in 60,000 troops and in the plane they changed from cuban military uniform to the venezuelan army uniform there was a regular battle going on with tanks and fighter jets in the southern state of Tachira. And now, too, they have flown in people, the Cubans, to help suppress the uprising, the protests, rather, because it's not an uprising, but the protests against the election fraud. Cuba also has uh, the palace, the, black, the white palace in front of the presidential palace, Miraflores, in Caracas. There, the Cubans control the intelligence apparatus of Venezuela. And the Cubans have political officers in all major parts of the, of the armed forces. So Venezuela is de facto under the boot of Cuba. Mm, how strange she didn't mention that yet. Maybe let's see if it comes. So shout out to Anya here for this. Like I said, again, go to the people who have been there that are very much aware of what's happening in Venezuela. But you guys see where this is going? Again, oil, resources. Now, Rania Kalik was there. She forgot the cocaine. The Venezuelan government under Maduro makes a lot more money on cocaine than they do on oil. Oil is secondary now. It's the cocaine that's the main product and gold also. The the benefit with gold, I was told this by a person who worked very closely with Maduro in the past. The benefit with gold is you just bring it to the customer and it's there. Cocaine you have to distribute to convert it to money. Covering the elections and we're going to dive into the part about the opposition. Because what corporate media, again, is also probably not going to make clear to you is that the opposition is on Israel's side. Oh, what's Israel got to do with Venezuela? So we're connecting different pieces here. Venezuela, the United States, Russia, and now we're also bringing in Israel to the mix as well. So shout out to uh, Rania Kalik for this news flash for sabrina the venezuelan opposition is not one little unitary group like this the venezuelan opposition is approximately 80 percent of the population in venezuela 
and 80% of the population in a country cannot have a single point of view. There are many different points of view. One, this is a threat. Let's be clear about which side you are on if you oppose Venezuela's elected government. Uh -huh. See here, she's coming with a threat here. Israel's side. I'm getting angry responses to my Venezuela reporting from people who purport to be pro-Palestine, yet repeat lies about Venezuela promoted by the same media justifying genocide on Gaza. Now, and that is just mind-blowingly stupid. What makes a fact, what makes an argument uh, relevant and truthful is if the facts presented are true or not, and if the logic holds up or not. The, the messenger is irrelevant. And he, here she is saying or reading this, that the same media is reporting that as that. That has got nothing to do with it. That just reveals that she's ignorant about how to make up her own opinion. This is an educational uh, handicap I think that we need to fix, right? She's falling into the trap of Russian propaganda by not using her brain. Because I'm noticing it too. Some of the same people that are pro-Palestine, they get that right, they get Gaza right, but they're getting other things wrong. <laughs> now, when, when, you, when she's getting into Gaza, let me just tell you one thing. I got a lot of friends who are Palestinian. And they don't support Hamas. Hamas is a terror organization. Hamas is supported by Iran. When I saw those attacks in Israel, I saw a lot of people dressed as Hamas who clearly do not have the ethnical characteristics of being Palestinians. They were clearly from other countries. The leader of Hamas who was just murdered in, in Iran, he's Egyptian or was. And there are lots of people from, from uh, Africa. So Hamas is an Iranian-supported terrorist organization that is keeping the Palestinians in Gaza hostage. That is why Hamas doesn't care one bit if the Palestinians die, because it's not their people. <laughs> you know, there are other things wrong. So shout out to Rania for calling that out because this does need to be said. You are still believing the lies that are told to you by corporate media. And that is the same media that's been lying to you about what's happening in Gaza. They've been lying to you to protect Israel. Okay, okay, and a okay, lot of okay, okay, stop it right there. One should not believe media. Media are just reporting. Sabrina has to learn to go out and do her own intelligence, to check the facts, to connect the dots herself. Do not believe. Get to the facts, Sabrina. People are falling for that. Don't fall for that. So if you get Gaza right, that's great. But then I want you to make the connection to other countries as well. The whole way of thinking that she has is wrong and and also she she seems to think that if you believe in a media or you believe in a person then everything that media that person says has to be true and everything somebody else says that's contrary to that has to be false that's thinking like in a sect that's a sect that's a cult that's not how it works in, in science or in law or anywhere. You get to the evidence. You look at individual pieces of evidence, original testimony, not hearsay. And if you deal with the person, you can trust the person and still don't have to believe what that person says. Because the person can be honest about what he or she believes, but can be wrong. So never believe what somebody else tells you, tells you as hearsay. What they tell you about themselves, that's one thing. What they tell you that they believe, that's one thing. But they can be wrong. You have to go to the original 
information and do an intelligence analysis like the CIA would do or, a or MI5. We have to go in and do intelligence. And that's what we have done in the Venezuelan opposition. Let's go on. Venezuela opposition leader, ah, Marina Karina Machado, who is currently been behind the violent coup attempt, loves Israel. Violent? Where's the violence? Hang on, Sabrina. Sabrina, if you call it violent, you go out and show it. Show it. Don't just lie to your viewers. That's a lie. In 2018, she wrote a letter to Israel's Netanyahu begging him to launch a military invention, intervention against her country's socialist government. This woman right here, this is what the West wanted. Do people see this? What people in Venezuela wanted in 2018 when a genocide was going on was for the international community to act because there is something called R2, what's it? R2P, responsibility to protect. After a number of genocides in the previous century, the international community under the United Nations got together and made a convention about responsibility to protect. And in fact, I was the one who brought this up in the resistance in Venezuela and it came to her attention and others. I was the one who found this, that they have sound, signed a convention for responsibility to protect. And I made the argument that the international community has a responsibility, a responsibility to stop the genocide that was going on in Venezuela in 2018. Did they do it? No. And by the way, do you know why the U.S. didn't act? Because Trump said no. Because Trump is on the side of Putin and Putin is on the side of Maduro. This is what the U.S. government wanted. Again, she is on Israel's side. So it's not just Maduro. Everybody wants to just say, oh, it's Maduro. He's a dictator. Da, da, da. No, there are a lot of moving pieces here. Maduro is a drug kingpin. And she hasn't mentioned that yet. So it goes on to say, let's go down to this video. Here is Venezuela's U.S.-backed opposition leader, Maria Karina Machado, promising to reestablish the Venezuelan embassy in occupied Jerusalem. I don't know why, they say, why she says U.S.-backed, because as far as I know, they are not getting support from the U.S. When I was helping the resistance in Venezuela, there was never any help from the U.S. government. So... Let's hear this video here. And this is what I wanted to show people. You have to get all the pieces. Thank you. And we'll stay in touch. And I promise we one day we'll have a close relationship between Venezuela and Israel. And I believe, and I can announce this, that our government will move our uh, Israeli embassy to Jerusalem. That will be part of our support to the state of Israel. Wow. In God's will. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> So there you go. They Let me make a little side remark here. The allies of Maduro, as I said, include Iran. Iran are financing Hamas. Israel is fighting Iran and Hamas and also Hezbollah. Iran is financing Hezbollah and the Houthis. And all of these, Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas and Houthis are waging a war on Israel. So... Venezuela, the people of Venezuela, not the government, but the people of Venezuela and Israel have a common enemy. So it's not so strange, this. They want to move the embassy. Oh, and I, I, I forgot to say that, that these groups, Hezbollah, for instance, they are in Venezuela. It's not just that they are connected through a common enemy. Hezbollah is in Venezuela. 
they have trained the guerrilla, the narco guerrilla, Yelen and, and FARC, who are in Venezuela, the Colombian guerrillas, the terrorist classified groups. So do you see, again, to Rania's point, if you support the opposition, you're actually on Israel's side. That's what Israel wants. And the U.S. government wants what Israel wants. So Let me remind you, Sabrina, in World War II, the U.S. helped communist Soviet Union, Stalin, an absolutely horrible regime that had committed a genocide by starvation a few years earlier because they saw it as the lesser evil against Nazi Germany. Do you see how this all goes together? Hmm? Sabrina, if you take the side of Maduro, you take the side of Trump. There's more. Det här är ett av de bästa rengöringsverktygen som jag personligen någonsin har sett. Du ska få höra. In 2020, Maria Karina Machado signed a cooperation agreement with Israel's Netanyahu-led Likud party, Likud party on political ideological and social issues, as well as advancing on issues related to strategy, geopolitics, and security. The same Netanyahu carrying out the genocide in Gaza. So she, again, she is aligned with the Likud party. So this is what people are supporting. And here's that piece of information here. Uh, start here, the foreign relations division. As I said, what they're fighting in Gaza is not the Palestinian people. It's Hamas, a terrorist organization supported by Iran. This is an asymmetrical war. And we really have to get together in the world and defeat this evil that is now the majority of the world. ...of the Likud party represented by Eli Vered Hazen and the uh, Vente Venezuelan party represented by Maria Karina Machado, undertake to forge an alliance between our two parties to cooperate on political, ideological, and social matters, as well as advancing cooperation on issues related to strategy, geopolitics, and security, among others, in order to create an operational partnership. So by Maduro... Hang on, she skipped the last paragraph. The goal is to bring the people of Israel closer to the people of Venezuela while advancing together the Western values to whom, to which both parties subscribe. Freedom, liberty, and a market economy. That is the goal. Dural winning, it's not just a lost cause for Israel. It's also a lost cause for the U.S. government because the U.S. government said that their interests align with Israel. So we always got to make sure we follow all of these cues here. We make sure we follow the dots. And here's another one. Look at this. Here is Venezuela's opposition leader, Maria, thanking Israel for recognizing the attempted U.S.-backed coup leader, Juan. Uh, Hang on. That was not a coup. That's enemy propaganda, she's saying right there. Juan Guaido was the leader, the president of the Congress after the opposition won a landslide victory in the presidential elections, a landslide victory. But the regime refused to acknowledge their loss. They denied a large number of elected congressmen to take their seats. And that's why a lot of countries in the world didn't started to consider that regime of Maduro illegitimate already in 2018, because the opposition had already proven with the government election authority, CNE, that they were the absolute majority. And somewhere in the order of 70% of the votes they had. Gerardo, so listen to this. So uh, Rania brought hella receipts. On behalf of the people of Venezuela, 
I would like to thank Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, for his recognition of Juan Guaido as the interim president of Venezuela. Of course. Prime Minister Netanyahu joins our many allies in the hemisphere and the world in welcoming Venezuela back to the bloc of Western democratic nations mm -hmm. that oppose despot and oppression. We certainly have a common enemy with Israel, the criminal forces that undermine freedom and peace in the world. Mm -hmm. Venezuela was one of the nations that back in 1947 in the General Assembly of United Nations supported Resolution 181 that led to the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Since then, we had good and strong diplomatic relations. That's why we, the Venezuelan people, look forward to the reestablishment of the diplomatic relations with the state of Israel. It's all very true. And of course, if you are a leader or a politi political party leader in one country, you are not taking sides in another country. You deal with them as representatives of that country, not individual parties. It would be completely wrong, for instance, for a party in Sweden or somebody who wants to be prime minister in Sweden to only deal with the Democrats or only deal with the Republicans in the United States. That would be to meddle in American uh, internal matters. Of course, they can cooperate on interchange of information and so on, but you have to have contacts with everyone. And I think to make this an issue is just ridiculous. She's simply thanking Israel, the prime minister of Israel today. If the Labour had been the prime minister, she would have done the same. I want to reaffirm the valuable contribution the Jewish community has given to the development of Venezuela through decades. It's true. And even though many have been forced to leave our country, we want and expect that they come back to rebuild our nation. Venezuela's reconstruction will require strong support and involvement in areas such as medicine, security. Uh, she's saying that because there have been anti-Semitism against the Jews in, in, uh, under this regime in Venezuela. Rural development and technology, where Israel can be a genuine partner. I want to express how meaningful it was for the Venezuelan people that this recognition to the genuine government of Venezuela came precisely the day of Holocaust recognition. I myself look forward to visit the state of Israel as soon as we conquer freedom. So everybody see a recurring theme here? Yes, we see the recurring theme. She's being diplomatic. All roads lead back to Israel and the U.S. government. We have a saying. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And this left, same thing happens in Sweden. All they see is Gaza. Gaza, 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 Gaza. Everything they see has to be connected to Gaza. And that is why, that is what, better said, that is what the dictator-in-chief, Vladimir Putin, is gaming on. By connecting the things in the right way, he gets people to dance according to his pipe. Trump has been criticizing Maduro, but as I said, Trump is close to Putin, and Putin is close to Maduro. So the reason why they're doing this and hiding the real relationships is just because in the US it was beneficial for Trump to win to be against Maduro. And it's beneficial for Maduro to win to be against Trump. But both are in the same criminal organization as Vladimir Putin. Recurring theme. So shout out to uh, Rania one more as well. This is another thing people need to understand. Uh, Maduro actually supports Palestine. Rania puts here, meanwhile, Maduro... 
We are allowed to support Palestine, but it doesn't mean we are supporting an Iranian-backed terrorist organization. Loves Palestine. Uh, if Maduro was unseated, this is coming from um, Alan... Uh, McLeod, if Maduro was unseated in July, some of the loudest applause will come from Tel Aviv. The bus driver turned politician has proven to be one of the staunchest international critics of Israel and supporters of Palestine. Israel is committing. That's not Palestine. I'm sorry. He's supporting a terrorist organization, just like he's supporting ELN and FARC, who are narco terrorists in Venezuela. Massacres in the Gaza Strip in front of the world's eyes without anyone deterring it. And Hamas could perfectly well end the conflict by releasing the hostages. They are not doing it because they are taking their marching orders from Iran. They are not Palestinian. Uh, claiming that Israel's actions constitute some of the worst barbarity seen since the days of Hitler. Maduro went on to condemn the European Union as accomplices in genocide. Uh, despite its own problematic economic situation, Venezuela has sent tons of aid to Gaza. Everybody hear this? That includes food, oil, drinking water, medical supplies. I want to see the proof of that. Show me the proof. Now, I'm not one to defend what is going on in Gaza, but you have to see both sides of the issue. Water prompts and mattresses. So again, supporting Gaza, supporting uh, the Palestinian cause, even... Supporting the Palestinian cause is one thing. Supporting Hamas is something completely different. The president of Mexico has something to say about all of this. So we're going to go ahead and bring him in. We're bringing in AMLO. And he wants to know why is the Organization of American States meddling in Venezuelan elections? Oh, AMLO wants to get it. AMLO is one of those leftist presidents who's also involved in protecting the cocaine traffic to the United States and the arms traffic south. So... But he wants to know why the OAA or OIS in English is meddling? Maybe because it's in their statutes. Maybe. Could that be? Listen to this. They're repeating. Oh, shoot. Ahí está. ¿Qué se tiene que meter la olla? Because it's in their statutes. OAS is there to protect democracy and freedom on the Western Hemisphere. That's why they threw out Cuba for one of the reasons. O sea, eso es injerencismo. Por eso la, la OEA no tiene credibilidad. Why doesn't he leave? So he's saying... Uh... The Americas don't have any credibility. No, no. <laughs> wow. That takes like the colmo, let's say in Spanish, of stupidity. Americas. OAS is the Organization of American States. All the countries on the continent, with the exception of French Guyana, because that's really part of France and some other countries connected to Europe. Now, the majority, the Organization of American States consists to about half of drug trafficking countries. About one third are tiny, tiny nation states in the Caribbean who are being bought by cocaine dollars in order to facilitate the smuggling of cocaine. They use yachts, sailing boats to pick up a uh, ton of cocaine here, ton of cocaine there, and bring it to Europe. And they get good money, and that's how they finance their pre presidential campaigns. So the fact that so many countries, tiny countries in the Caribbean, vote for Venezuela in the OAS is because of that. And before, they were corrupted by oil money, Petro Caribe, by loans, loans that they didn't have to pay back, and that got, went directly into the president's pocket. That was Hugo Chavez deal.
¿Con qué fundamento la OEA? So, Under what basis does the OAS claim the other candidate won? Tiene que the proof, maybe, just saying. No, el otro candidato. So again, that's AMLO. President of Mexico again calling out the U.S. government. Why are no? She, he doesn't call out the U.S. government. He was talking about OAS, Organization of American States. This woman doesn't know it. She's talking without knowing anything. Are you meddling here? So all of that happened, and then there was a coup attempt. Now we're going to follow Alan for this one as well. There. There is no coup attempt except by Maduro. He did do a coup, a self-coup. Maduro did a self-coup. There is an attempted coup. There's an attempted coup d'etat underway here in Venezuela as the U.S.-backed opposition is trying to overturn yesterday's election results. It's wild, Let fam. Let us see. There is no doubt that an attempted coup d'etat is underway here in This is so much BS, it's incredible. How can anybody... Oh. You know what happened? People who know that they won because there were hundreds of thousands of normal people as witnesses in every polling booth in the entire country. And they know that they won a landslide victory. And the regime pronounced Maduro the winner. Would you take that sitting down? Would you? Or would you go out to the street and say, no, we won. That's what they did. And he calls it a coup. Venezuela. The only question is how successful will it be? Yesterday, less than 24 hours ago, President Nicolas Maduro won the 2024 Venezuela. Sorry, he didn't win it. He declared himself the winner. Like Donald Trump declared himself the winner in 2020 elections. He gained 51% of the vote. His closest challenger, Edmundo Gonzalez, won 44%. The results were immediately ratified by several regional countries, including Bolivia, Nicaragua, Honduras, and Cuba. All of whom are involved in the cocaine trafficking. It was also endorsed by large countries like China and Russia. Who are allies. And you see, th these are nuclear powers, military powers with nukes, also Iran and North Korea. And all four of these nuclear powers are protecting Venezuela. So Venezuela is the forward military base of four nuclear powers who are enemies of the United States. The United States, however, immediately cast aspersions on the events, saying that there were serious irregularities. Those words prompted Edmundo Gonzalez and his supporters to come out into the streets today and uh, vent their... No, 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 no. They didn't go out on the streets because the U.S. said something. They went out to the streets because the regime was trying to deprive them of their right to elect the president they want. The vast majority of Venezuelans voted for Edmundo Gonzalez. And there would have been even higher, there would have been over 80% for the opposition candidate if all Venezuelans would have been allowed to vote. Fury. Many shops uh, closed early or didn't open at all today, fearing the worst. In certain areas, it's very calm, it's very tranquil. In other areas, it's extremely tense. And in still more, we see thousands of people out on the streets, uh, burning uh, tires, setting fire to different things, even attacking police officers. Nicolas Maduro has warned that the opposition plans a bloodbath and that this could turn in. No, no, no. He has said that there will be a bloodbath and the one who's going to do the violence is him because it's always him. It's always the security forces that start the violence. ...into something of a civil war. Mint Press yep. will keep you updated from Caracas as events uh, transpire. It's very hard to see how the opposition could start a violent, bloody uprising when they are not armed and the security forces are armed to their teeth and they have including, including Cuban and Russian assistance. You see, the leaders, they have their bodyguards are Russians now because they no longer can trust the Venezuelans.
So everybody remember this. And again, uh, if you think about who is calling for peace and who's actually committing the, the violence, you know, you, you can see that a lot of times the ones who are calling for peace is the opposition. Read the statements by President-elect Edmundo Gonzalez and Maria Corina. Read them. I challenge her to read them. Uh, the opposition here that was basically trying to make it seem like, well, Maduro is, is not going to be peaceful, etc. cetera. Uh, but you do have um, the opposition pushing that violence into the streets. No, no, no. On the contrary, the opposition is saying, stay calm. The opposition is saying that. As I predicted before the election, several days before the, the election, I made a video predicting that the regime would instigate violence after the election and the bloodbath by pretending to be opposition. And it happened. It happened. We have got video proof of that. I think this was from Puerto Ayacucho. I got a video where regime thugs got material together, stones and stuff, and, lay, and, and drove off. And the, the woman recording it on her cell phone is saying, these are from the regime, these are from the regime. They did do it. The regime goes out and starts these violent actions dressed up as and pretending to be opposition. And that even escalated into shooting with tear gas and stuff. My friend got a tear gas grenade, grenade shot into his house in that fight between fake opposition and the security forces. And since then, I haven't heard from him. And then Maduro also called this out as well. He said, uh, I'm getting a video here of the burning of PSUV's headquarters in Calabozo. This is very typical of what they call color revolutions designed by the Americans. It's a script. Listen to this is exactly what I predicted the regime would do. Do acts of violence and accuse the opposition for it. To this. Gente, me está llegando una imagen acá de la quema de la casa de el PSUV en Calabozo. Aquí está. And after the, she made this video, they have even gone out and, and killed a couple of PSUV election uh, polling station election workers, the heads of polling station. They've killed their own people, surely in order to accuse the opposition of being behind it. But what's really behind it is that they found out that they have traitors, as they see it, inside their ranks. Sad. En Calabozo, por aquí, ¿no? Vamos a ponerlo otra vez. Grupo de delincuentes. Vamos por todos ustedes, tengan la seguridad. Cuando yo digo algo, lo hago. Lo hacemos. ¿Mm? Igualmente han procedido a quemar alcaldías, a atacar sedes del poder público. Esto es muy típico, Diosdado, de lo que llaman la revolución de los colores, que diseñan los gringos. Es un guión, correcto, es un guión. Mm -hmm. Notice that uh, for them, the non-violent struggle, like in Ukraine, the Arab Spring, all of that they call coups, because obviously they are dictators. So they are trying to paint that as something negative, something bad. While in reality, of course, it's a popular uprising the majority of the people who are peacefully protesting and uh, def defying the authoritarian regime. For them, that's negative, obviously. So again, he acknowledges that it's a script. It's the same playbook. Okay. Yes, it's a playbook. The playbook you can you can read it if you go to the Albert Einstein Institute website, reeinstein.org, I think it is. Nonviolent struggle. Dr. Gene Sharp, 
has written a lot of books. May he rest in peace. The Institute is now led by a woman from Afghanistan. Uh, ah, forgot her name now. Uh, and uh, there you can see 192 methods, for instance, of non-violent struggle. Pretenden traer a Venezuela. Tranca de calles, autopistas, quemas, ponen cauchos, queman. Y la mayoría de esta gente drogada y armada. Which is a lie. Oh. A common mistake when buying discs is you're getting the wrong ones that you can't throw. They're too overstable and I've done this mistake. Mm-hmm. Tranca de calles, autopistas, quemas. Ponen cauchos, queman. Y la mayoría de esta gente drogada y armada. Which is a lie. Mm -hmm. uh... Which is a lie, obviously. Yes, there are some who have used drug, and that's not strange because cocaine is very cheap in Venezuela compared to in the United States or Sweden. Where I was kidnapped in Colombia, the price of one kilo of cocaine is seven hundred dollars the ones who told me that are it was the gorilla itself those who kidnapped me and armed yes there are lots of criminals in venezuela venezuela is one of the most heavily armed countries in the world illegally because of criminals and thugs you know normal street criminals and they are protesting the regime just like everybody else. They are part of the people. Uh, Corey, we can go ahead and go to part two for a tight VNC. So everybody sees what's happening like instantly because the person that won that they didn't want to win all of a sudden is just. She still has not shown any evidence at all that Maduro supposedly won. She's just taking the dictator's own word for it. Just like the MAGA supporters are taking Trump's own word for that he won in 2020. It's it's wild. It's, it's crazy. We're definitely going to be keeping an eye on Venezuela uh, to make sure things don't continue to escalate because this is not good. We have... To how much more can it escalate when already one fourth of the population has fled the country to avoid dying in starvation caused by the regime? When is she going to speak up against that? When is she going to take a stance against crimes against humanity? When is she going to take a stance against genocide? You know, it makes me upset to hear people who pretend to be defending freedom and democracy, take the side of violent regimes like Stalin and Hitler, because that's what she's doing. Too much going on at the same time internationally. You have the war with Russia and Ukraine. You have Israel is still bombing kids in, in Gaza. I just talked about the school that was just bombed. Uh, on Sunday, there was another school that was bombed. More Palestinian kids have been killed. I just saw a headline earlier before I went live that said that uh, Israel has now bombed Beirut. Like, it's crazy. There's conflict in the Middle East. There's conflict with Russia and Ukraine. Now you have uh, craziness happening in Venezuela. And again, I just want to tell people a lot of times, a lot of this is prompted by the U.S. government. The U.S. Lie. It is connected. But the one behind it is Vladimir Putin. The U.S. government, our government, that we elected in free and fair elections, are fighting for freedom. And she is taking side with the enemy. Government pushes. They push, push these coups. The coup in Venezuela. That was the U.S. government. No, it was not. She is helping and abetting the enemy. This has happened multiple times. The U.S. government tries to be the world's police. If she doesn't like the U.S., I don't understand why she doesn't go and live in Russia, for instance. And
And as soon as these countries decide that they don't want to do business with the West anymore because of the way that the U.S. has been, and they decide they want to collaborate with other countries, all of a sudden they're they're evil. No, it's not because they want to collaborate with other countries per se. It's because they want to collaborate with other countries sending cocaine to the United States as a chemical weapon in order to undermine the United States. It's an asymmetrical war. And this girl is taking side for the enemy. Because they decide they want to join BRICS, because they want to work with other countries, they want a multipolar world. They don't want to be dominated by the U.S. government that has really been policing the world. Unfortunately, there is a lack of force behind the idea of freedom and democracy. It's a difficult concept to promote and to defend. Because a, a dictator, for a dictator, for an authoritarian, is simple. He simply orders his people and the security forces and the military to do things, to go out to another country, to carry out an assassination. It's easy for Putin. It's easy for criminals. In a democracy like the United States, it's a lot more difficult because there are controls, checks and controls on the government. We have Congress. We have the Senate. It's much more difficult to do things. And that's why in the U.S., in order to try to do things, some presidents have resorted to having clandestine operations and the CIA have resorted to get money under the table from dirty sources since they can't get it openly, according to what I read and heard. The problem is that when the money comes openly, there is control. And if you need to do something clandestine, cland, how do you say that? Under the table, let's say. And in these kinds of operation, in this kind of asymmetrical warfare against rogue regimes, you have to operate sometimes in the hidden. And you need to have operations that the enemy doesn't know about. For instance, here in Sweden, uh, I don't know the situation now, but in the past there was an intelligence organization and the only thing known was that it had a, a boss. That's it. Everything else was hidden, secret. And it has to be that way because as soon as something is known about it, the enemy has a way to infiltrate it. And these the drug cartels, they have infiltrated the U.S. a lot, including the CIA. Cuba is a drug cartel. Cuba is the leader of this drug cartel, but they they got in uh, in under Vladimir Putin many years ago. So now he is the head of the global organized crime organization. And it's a problem. And so for all the people who are coming out saying, oh, but he's a dictator, he's a dictator, da, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Ah, yeah. She doesn't care that he's a dictator. Maybe she, she should go and live in Russia. That's not our space. That's not our place. It's not our place. The Venezuelan people have the same right as the American people to decide who should be their leader. If they do not want a dictatorship, they have the right not to have a dictatorship. And she's here basically saying that let them have a dictator. I mean, God. She's all over the map. Place to tell another country who their leader should be. It's she's, not our place to tell another. She's actually arguing in favor of the dictator. Wow. Another country who they should be voting for. Don't we? No, but they voted for Edmundo Gonzalez. They didn't vote for Maduro. Criticize other countries and accuse them for meddling in our elections, but it's okay for the US government to tell every other country who should be in charge of their country and do. The US is not doing that. She is misrepresenting the facts. Who they're bidding? I'm against US intervention. Yes, we should not intervene except to protect against crimes against humanity. 
And there is a convention for that responsibility to protect. We should not be involved with these countries. Leave these countries alone. If a foreign country commits genocide, should we leave it alone? That's what she's saying. And let them govern themselves. I really believe a lot of these countries would be better off today had it not been for U.S. intervention. I really do believe that. The problem is that the U.S. hasn't intervened. So she's, I mean, the U.S. has not intervened in Venezuela for many, many, many years. She's wrong on that point, and therefore she's reaching an erroneous conclusion. So that's it. That's the end of it. I'm sorry that the camera went away for a while there, but uh, now I saw all of it, half an hour, and basically it's a lot of feelings and very thin on facts and wrong. On many facts, she's wrong. I can understand that she's afraid for all these conflicts in the world, but she is looking for the responsible, the guilty one, in the wrong place. It's not the United States that is responsible. It's Vladimir Putin and his allies who are responsible for that. I made another video the other day about an introduction to Venezuela, what you need to know. And there I show a map with their allies. And Venezuela is a drug cartel, part of a drug cartel led by Russia, protected by four nuclear powers. And Venezuela has armament that Russia and China basically haven't sold to any other country except Venezuela. And why? Because Venezuela is their forward military base that threatens the United States from the near, near, near area, the near zone, from the south. It's very close from Venezuela to the United States for a ballistic missile. So that's, and they're also very close to the Panama Canal, which is a crucial, crucial for global tr trade. So, and that's where they get the, the drugs from, the cocaine from Colombia into Venezuela. So Venezuela is key for them. So thank you for watching this and I hope it didn't horrify you too much to hear this. Over and out.